Welcome to another Tez Talks Radio episode. I'm your host, William McKenzie of Tezos Commons. And today we have our other co host, uh, Brian Lee of Tezos Commons. Uh, we're going to get into a few ecosystem updates. It's been quite a, a lot of news as of late. Um, but before we get into all of that, uh, Brian, how's everything been? I had sushi last night. <laughs> Not the DeFi token, right? Oh, no. I had, <laughs> I had real sushi. It was much better than buying a DeFi token on Binance. A DeFi token on Binance. How weird does that sound? Crazy. Absolutely insane. Yeah. So if I had bought that instead, I would be, I would not have it have had a good day uh, when I woke up this morning. So yeah, I think you probably got more out of having the actual shoot, uh, sushi. Yeah. I'm bullish on real sushi, not virtual <laughs> sushi. So yeah, we've got a lot of things to talk about today. Uh, so let's jump into the first topic. So Will, do you want to go over some of the recent developments in terms of STOs on the Tezos network? Uh, sure. So the most recent developments uh, that we've kind of witnessed uh, within the past few weeks was the listing of Aspen coin on T0. It's pretty nice to see when it was first listed. I believe the trading volume was over 130,000. So that's definitely providing a good test case for you know any potential issuers. Uh, and other companies wish, wishing to recreate uh, the Aspen coin scenario. I think it will also lead to a lot of other positives, uh, which we can perhaps get into a little bit later. Another announcement was QR Capital. Currently, we're already aware of elevated returns and uh, the exchange that they are partnered with, uh, Alpha Points, but QR Capital is going to uh, launch a new digital exchange on Tezos, and I believe they're actually the largest crypto hedge fund in Brazil. So Mm. there's definitely been quite a few updates uh, within the SDO space as of late. Uh, Brian, do you have any specific points you'd like to mention? Well, I mean, I think this is definitely pretty bullish, and... I think at first glance, when you see something like $130,000 in volume on the first day, it might not sound that much compared to what's been going on. Uh, You know, with all these DeFi tokens and stuff, you know, people just throwing all of their cash around and yeah, but like we have to remember that uh, this Aspen coin exchange here is actually something that is in line with the law. (laughs) So the people who are trading this back and forth you know it's not just whales trying to splash their cash around and do some really weird things you know all of these DeFi pools lately that you see you know it's really all controlled by whales you know once they pull it out then everyone gets wrecked so it's like a completely different thing so you i don't think it's really a good idea to to compare the volume with regard to what's happening over in DeFi land and i guess in crypto land to a certain extent as well like we have to remember that this aspen coin is actually tokenizing uh shares of the saint regis aspen resort uh over in colorado and it represents what was it like 18 million dollars in in value that's a really good point i mean it's fully regulated you know it's not like you're just kind of throwing your money out out on a uniswap and hoping for the best right No, it's definitely a good test case. And I I think a lot of eyes are definitely on Tezos, uh, especially after seeing such a successful listing and launch. Yeah, well, I think the the point here is just that like $130,000 is not nothing, right? So it's showing that there's actual interest in this use case, you know, to trade shares of the Aspen Hotel. So... I'm looking forward to to see how this uh, shapes up over the coming months. But yeah, I'm super excited about this use case. Like we've talked about maybe two or three episodes ago. It's just pretty cool use case for blockchain and uh, especially for the Tezos blockchain. Yeah, we've dove deep into STOs. So uh, we'll probably link a couple of those episodes previously if you like to hear a little bit more in-depth discussion on that. Moving on from there, 
Another really exciting update uh, happened just recently. It was surrounding kiln uh, development. Brian, would you like to talk about the kiln update? <laughs> yeah, I, I just I can't stop if laughing. You can get the name right. Oh god, <laughs> we we were talking about this before the podcast. I just can't say kiln. It's like kiln, kiln. Uh, <laughs> I'm not making fun of the name. I just I I'm making fun of myself because I just can't say this word for some reason. But but yeah, uh, kiln is like a it's essentially an app that you can install. I believe it's only for Mac OS right now. And right. it lets you set up a Tezos node. It lets you uh, keep track of the health of the node and the bakers as well. And I think a tool like this is very important and also something that you don't see in a lot of blockchain networks because in other blockchains and in Tezos as well, you know, most of the core tools are built for people who are familiar with the command line, right? And for the general population who have been, who have been, I guess, bred or uh, taught to, to type things on their phone, to have some nice looking things to click, some buttons and stuff, people don't really know how the computers used to work back in the old days, right? Not just in the old days, but even today, uh, a lot of powerful tools, especially if you're uh, looking into administrating networks and batch things, command line is kind of where it's at. It's a really fast way to get around your computer. It's no surprise that most devs and most technical people prefer that way because it also means you don't have to build out all of these nice looking buttons. So I feel like a lot of blockchain networks are talking about decentralization without thinking about decentralizing the way that people interface with the network. What I mean by that is, you know, uh, if people like my mom or my dad who don't know how to do the command stuff, you know, if what if they wanted to spin up a node, you shouldn't say like, well, why would they want to do that? Right. Because then that's not really decentralization because you want to make this available to as many people as possible and also understand that a lot of people either don't have uh, the technical skills to learn or they just don't want to learn. So by making a way that allows you to spin up a node just on your local Mac. So if you have like a MacBook Pro or MacBook Air, like the MacBook <laughs> Air that you are recording on right now, you know, you can just download Kiln and you can just spin up a node. And um, moving forward, the development and maintenance of the software is actually going to be run by a consortium uh, that includes teams from Baking Bad, Obsidian Systems, Tezos Commons, and TQ Tezos, uh, along with some support from the community. So if you're on a Mac and you're interested in playing around with uh, like how to set up a node, uh, on the Tezos network and you don't want to use the confusing command line stuff because not a lot of people are into that, I guess. So I would definitely recommend checking this out. Uh, we'll go ahead and share the link to the post and uh, the link to version 0.8.1. Yes, we will. And I think we can go ahead and move on to our next topic. This was something... It was announced just a few days ago. It was put out by, I believe, Spruce Systems. There's going to be some work around decentralized identity on uh, Tezos. Uh, Brian, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So decentralized identity is this sort of new thing. I feel like a lot of projects are looking at this lately. My D. Yeah, so if you follow Icon at all, uh, you might know that recently uh, they deployed a DID over in South Korea and it's being adopted by all these big banks and everything. So it's kind of a new thing that's happening in the background. It does not have as much of a spotlight as all of these shiny like food tokens, hot dog, sushi, kimchi, you know. In the background, there is actually real work going on. I would never spend a billion dollars for sushi or a hundred million for a hot dog that's a really expensive hot dog and i hope that stuff never comes to this blockchain because it's just it just makes a bad name you know when right. all these people start launching these food tokens but yeah back to the point of 
DID. <laughs> the whole premise of it is kind of like it's kind of like returning control of people's data back to the people. Um, so now when we're talking about identity, it's not really peer to peer. Like when you make like a Facebook account or something like that, your identity is essentially being controlled or being stored by Facebook, which is in between you and and Facebook, right? So if you want to use Facebook, you have to you have to sign in with an account that you made on Facebook. The idea of DID is to, you know, return ownership of the data back to the user. And I'm excited to see that it's coming to Tezos because most blockchain applications now are kind of a closed off environment. So all of the processing takes place on the blockchain and the blockchain does not really have access to the outside world uh, unless you have things like DIDs and things like the recent partnership with with Chainlink, you know, to bring in these real time price feeds from outside of the blockchain. Uh, and we also have the recent Harbinger, uh, which is a price oracle that's built directly on Tezos. So DID is really important for these kinds of use cases because especially when you're talking about trusted price feeds, it's important to know the identity of who is giving you that price feed, right? There should be a way for them to prove that they are who they are uh, without having to use some kind of external system just to prove that. So if there was a way to do it directly on the Tezos blockchain with a native implementation of this kind of decentralized identity, it really adds like a lot of use cases and a lot of value to the Tezos network. Just because you're you're opening up the power and uh, the structure of the network to a lot more use cases that um, require people to have an identity. So anything from you know trying to borrow or lend, you really need some kind of identity to, unless you're just trying to swap you know food coins. Uh, like if you're trying to do something real, like if you want to lend to someone, like they want to buy a house or something. It's better for for that to be legit, right? Like I wouldn't want to borrow cash from, you know, some meme guy on on some weird website. So if there was a real lending provider out there who operated on the blockchain, you know, this would let them prove who they are. And uh, that's really important if you want to do things in line with the law. As we know with Tezos, you know, they, they're really focused on these real world use cases of blockchain that comply with the law. Uh, so from the stuff we've seen with like, you know, the Bank of France and multiple financial institutions in Brazil and other parts of the world, you know, they're very interested in pushing this blockchain out to be able to use in these real ways. So uh, to have something like this Spruce implementation, I think it's a great addition to uh, what the network will be capable of in the future. Yeah, and especially with the uh, Delphi uh, proposal and all the opportunities for DeFi that are going to open up with the reduced gas fees, uh, which we are constantly seeing plague Ethereum at the moment. You know, if you try to send 20 bucks, you'll end up paying more on a transaction fee. It's completely un unusable. Like, yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's one thing I think Tezos really did right. You know, the gas fees, initially they were set conservatively with the expectation and notion that, you know, it can be essentially ratified on yeah. chain. And what we're seeing right now is kind of the perfect timing for that with all the developments going on in DeFi. Yeah, it's just so interesting. Like when it comes to Ethereum... Uh, like I was actually trying to buy some tokens, not the food tokens, but I was trying to <laughs> buy some other tokens. I think I was buying like Teller or something uh, before they got listed on Binance. And I was buying it on good old Uniswap uh, V2. And it was just ridiculous because you kind of have to profit 10% on the trade just to uh, pay for the gas fee. And you come out break even. <laughs> right, right, right. So in my case, like right after I bought it, you know, it got listed on some other exchanges and it went up. And for me, it was more of an experiment because 
I saw a, lo a lot of people talking about this and I just bought, I don't know, I bought like 50 bucks or something. That's usually how most crypto investments are made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw people talking about this new way to trade, like this, you swap, you swap. And I was like, what the heck is this? So I just had some free time one day and I was like, okay, I can, I guess I can spend a small amount of cash to learn what's going on. So, so I bought into it and you know, I didn't really buy it as an investment. I was just, it was kind of the first coin that popped up that I actually saw before. <laughs> so I just decided to go with that. And I don't know, I, I think I paid like 12 bucks in gas fees for a $50 buy. So that's like 25% of the amount that I was trying to buy. And here are these same people complaining about like PayPal fees and like bank fees while at the same time, you know, I'm trying to make this $50 swap and I'm paying 12, I'm paying 12 bucks on it just to get it included into the queue uh, for a chance to buy. Right. So I think this whole gas fee war is ridiculous. It almost makes you think like, is the market actually fueled by real things or is it just fueled by people's greed? Like if, if someone is willing to pay 25% of the price of their trade just just to get in i think it says more about you know the kind of people that are involving themselves in the market kind of sounds like gambling to me and i think if we go into a future where we have more networks that are capable of this kind of use case without the excessive gas fees i think it will actually help mature the whole ecosystem as a whole because it can because it, it can appeal to more people who are just here to gamble and I think that's really important. I suppose only a few understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> only a few understand. Yeah. But on a serious note, I don't see fees being a huge issue. Um, you know, obviously with DeFi, they, they are currently, but I don't see fees being a main value proposition for something. Well, if we look at Litecoin or other coins that have praised they have less fees than Bitcoin, I mean, obviously that really hasn't turned out well for them in terms of value. Because Bitcoin is still the top cryptocurrency, but just more from that, I don't really see someone who's going to send a large amount of capital over the blockchain worrying about a fifteen, twenty dollar fee. You know, if you're sending a hundred thousand, you know, even ten thousand, or even a thousand, I yeah. don't think you'll really be too concerned by that. But when you get into like the example you brought up, the smaller increments, obviously that has a little bit more of an effect. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to to the use case. So for a blockchain like Bitcoin, yeah, I think if you're trying to send a thousand bucks, you know, a million bucks, no one's really going to care about the fee. But also, I think that's that's an effect of the blockchain not having full blocks right now. I think back in 20... 20 something, 2016, 2015, before all of that Bitcoin scaling, SegWit stuff. Lightning Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there was a time where Bitcoin fees were also outrageous. And at that time, I feel like there were people talking about uh, they tried to use Litecoin more and all of these different cryptos. So it's, so I think it's a mixture of use case and also transaction activity. So, uh, I think when when this whole DeFi thing first first popped off and not a lot of people knew about it, the fees were still OK. But now there's what, one point two billion in volume on. Uniswap. Yeah. So when you have these like big ramp ups in usage, you really get to see like the weaknesses of the network. When more people jump on board, you know, the fees are, are going to go up because you're trying to compete with a lot of people to try to get your stuff into the block. So I'm glad that uh, this Delphi thing is happening. I think it's a good time to talk about this stuff because we desperately need an alternative to Ethereum like as soon as possible. And I guess the main issue kind of is Ethereum's been around for so long that a lot of people are comfortable with just trying to launch a coin on there. I feel like part of that is it's just because it's so simple to do it. And also a lot of these coins that are launching are just actual scams. So they don't really have an incentive to put in the work to learn a new platform to launch their coin. 
So I hope to see more real building as we proceed over the next few years. Like after this craze, you know, I hope things ramp down a bit and the real teams can really think like, oh, if this happens again and I have a real thing that I'm trying to build, do I want to risk being on an, on a network that can be plagued by people who are trying to launch scams? Because then that would make my thing really slow and it can't really be used and it'll, it'll be bad for me. So maybe like those kinds of devs and those kinds of companies will look towards different platforms. So I think it's it's a good time for for us to look at you know, trying to scale up the performance of the blockchain. So yeah, did you want to talk about the Delphi proposal? As everyone knows, you know, we just passed the proposal period. We're currently in the exploration voting period right now. You know, Tezos has four phases, which a protocol upgrade must undergo and pass and meet quorum to be successfully activated. Yeah, we're in the exploration voting period right now. Delphi is supposed to reduce gas fees by, I believe, about 3.5 to four times. I'm really personally excited for it. You know, obviously, we're not going to see a SAP link in this upgrade, but I don't think you should knock off this upgrade just being something minor because there, there's a lot of changes that I think really make it a bigger deal than, you know, what I've seen people across social channels uh, discuss. Definitely looking forward to seeing how this goes. And we also have, on top of the lower gas fees, we have Dexter, which is a decentralized exchange built by Camel Case. That's supposed to be released probably close, if not after we upload this podcast. So I think it's really exciting that Tezos is diving straight into DeFi. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. Uh, Brian, do you... Have anything you'd like to add? Yeah. So in addition to the decrease in gas fees, um, there is also going to be 3.5 times more TZ to TZ uh, op calls in the block. And your contract may perform 10 times more internal calls. So in addition to scaling down the gas fees, uh, this, this update is also going to basically allow more computation to take place in each block that will allow for higher performance contracts, which I think is really useful for stuff like real-time swaps and other DeFi use cases. So yeah, so I think this is definitely a great thing. And I don't know, I hope to see more of the legitimate Ethereum projects maybe migrate over after this goes live. I mean, if, if all of the things make sense and your devs are capable of working on this platform as well you never know when the next like scam thing is going to come around and all of these people are trying to launch their coins and that will have a real effect on your app as well unless ethereum can scale uh, which they've been talking about it for a long time but uh, it has yet to arrive so yeah definitely a great thing for tezos and the last topic for today that we wanted to talk about uh, is the invited ecosystem. So, Will, did you want to give some updates with that? For the last topic we wanted to talk about, uh, recently, Carlo Van Driesten, he did a Q&A with the Tezos Foundation. Uh, I believe that was published just a few weeks ago. There's been some exciting developments going on with that, and Tezos is a potential candidate for the uh, consortium of, you know, all these big car companies, Audi, Daimler, Porsche, et cetera, to use for the development of these autonomous uh, driving functions. And we're actually going to have a podcast uh, with Carlo later this month. So be sure to stick around and stay tuned for that, uh, where we will go a lot more in depth on all the work that they're doing. All right. Well, if Brian, you don't have anything else to add, be sure to stay tuned for our next podcast with Carlo Van Driesten of Invited. 